welcome everyone at our first event of the year at Room for Discussion. Today, jointly with Rostra Economica. The attention span, so the amount of time that we spend concentrating on a task before getting distracted, for a goldfish, it's only nine seconds. That doesn't sound long, right? Well, for a human, on average, it's only 8.25 seconds. And this number becomes all the more alarming when we realize that we live in an era of massive information flow. Political scandals, scandals, parliamentary elections, wars. The information that we get and needs to proceed, they increase in amount, complexity, and controversy. Can journalism and academia keep up with that fast and ever-changing world? How, in an era of social platform, platforms, can we find reliable information and how can you write about those complex issues both convincingly and responsibly? These are only some of the questions we want to discuss with our three panelists today by um, reflecting on their careers up until now, by discussing the challenges of journalism today and by also taking a glimpse into the future. So our first guest is Penny Sheets Thibault. She's a professor at the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences and researches in political communication and public opinion. She also teached a course in data journalism. Our second guest is Lisanne Nykrak, an independent journalist that wrote articles for, among others, Foreign Policy, CBC, and The Correspondent. She's also an academic tutor in PPLE College. And our final guest is Case Hasnot. He is a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics and Business and focuses on public choices and development economics in India in his research. So please welcome them all with a warm applause. Welcome to our couches. Today it's really your privilege to sit here and not ours, <laughs> but um, we have the privilege to talk to you. So we just heard in the intro speech that the reality of journalism is um, pretty challenging and demanding, but let's start on a more positive note. Um, do you have one key experience that made you go in your respective careers? Penny, for you um, into academia? Well, <clears throat> let's see. <laughs> My experience that probably taught me that academia was a good career experience <clears throat> is probably counterintuitive, but my father is a professor, and I used to see him, my associated memories of him as a child is that he was at home in his sweatpants reading the entire newspaper every morning, and I was like, that looks like a pretty good job. <laughs> and then he would go teach and be very busy, and I never really saw the stressful side of academic publishing and grading and these sorts of things, but I really liked that you could just, you know, ask questions, always be curious to learn new things and engage with fresh perspectives from students. And uh, Case, can you relate to that or is it a different experience for you? <laughs> um, for me it was actually during my period at university where I just kind of started to get to know these economic models and was got really interested in, okay, how can you figure out the way that the world works through it and ask, answering these questions and explaining that and understanding that that is really what got me more than the, than the, the, um, the secondary job uh, character. Uh, so for you it was more like a process than a key experience? Yes, mm -hmm. I, there was no one experience was really um, figuring out that, hey, I like figuring out the way the world works and academia is a good place to do that and engaging with these kinds of questions in, in a cool and deep way. And Dizan, for you to go into journalism? Um, yeah, I was thinking just now, I had a bit of time, um, but um, so the moment I, I really decided to go into journalism was 2018 and I just worked for two and a half, three years at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands in The Hague and I 
uh, a Quetz, uh, went to Nicaragua um, and learned Spanish and was spent there some time. W was there any community. specific reason why you why you quit at the time? Or yeah, I mean, I, yeah, there was absolutely a reason. No, I, I I was actually really yearning for more independence and autonomy. At that moment, I, I learned a lot from you know in working the workings of, of this um, of this organization, and I realized no, actually maybe I should I should really rediscover what, what it feels like to, to do my own research, to, to, to hear stories, to uncover stories. I was in Nicaragua when the Civil War broke out in 2018. So this was where, um, you know, I, people went to the streets in Managua and we didn't know what was going on. And I, I realized, ah, you know, I was actually just starting naturally to talk to people. I was really curious what was going on. And that's where I realized, hey, maybe this this background that I have in, in international um, law and even human rights law, refugee law, I can actually link to human stories, human interest stories, and then create German stories about them. Um, and that's where I, I signed up for this um, fellowship in global journalism in Toronto, where I started um, working in Germany. Yeah, very courageous and um, relatable story. Yeah. And and like you in the past, we just explored a part of your personal story. Many people, probably also in our audience, now in this, in this such decisive journey or decisive key point. But we know that the media is not only flowers and rainbows. So can each of you name one main challenge, one main challenge that aspiring journalists face today? And let me start with Lizam here. You're making me tears between all these, oh yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with a very basic and important one, which is income. Um, you know, it, it's it's um, there's been a, a trend, of course. I don't know, and want to go into that too deep, maybe. But you know, traditional media organizations have really faced a steep decline in, in revenues. Right? Advertisers went to big platforms, um, uh, and the internet became much more important from the 90s. Zeros and We've seen a lot of layoffs, journalists got, um, you know, people are no longer willing to pay for their news. I mean, there, there has been some revival during COVID with membership models and there's different ways that are being tested now. But um, I think to say, I think around one third in the Netherlands at least is a freelance journalist. So it's not working in a, you know, in a, in a newsroom. And I remember when I was in my uh, Toronto uh, education, there was this woman from the, new, from the Washington Post, I think, um, she had covered NAFTA and like the biggest stories and I thought, oh, well, she's going to inspire us and, you know, give us, and the first thing she said was, I'm going to, I'm going to burst some bubbles here. I live with my parents. I'm 34. Uh, I make barely, you know, a thousand dollars a month. Uh, I pitch five times a week my stories. They get picked up twice, three, maybe a week. Um, so it's, it's also this reality of you know, how many freelancers are cross-subsidizing their work is what we call it, so they will do, you know, another job on the side, like I do, actually, um, you know, to also finance being able to do journalism. So that's a bit of a bubble to burst if you're a freelancer, right? So it's even, it's different if you're in a staff uh, or you're in a newsroom, you know, but also newsrooms are shrinking. So it's, it's that's definitely a challenge I would, uh, it's, it's a bit of a boring one about money, but yeah. It, it is actually for your livelihood quite, quite relevant. And case maybe let me rephrase this question also a bit. What is the one main challenge that aspiring academics face today, would you say? Or maybe if you had an answer for the previous one, <laughs> that could also work. Well, it, it, you, could, like, you could have given me some time to prepare for this. I was prepared <laughs> for the other one. Um, I think, honestly, one... Oh, now, now you're picking, making me pick between multiple again. <laughs> Um, is just the increased competition. It's it's a very boring logistical one, like like is just <laughs> like there are only so many positions, and there are a lot of people who want to go into academia, and the competition is really really crazy. And being able to like get your paper, get your work through to um, to where you want it to be, or where you're your supervisors, your professors want it to be, that is a, is a really big challenge. It's just the, 
like there's so many people who go, who go there and only so much space in journals and in universities. Very boring, sorry. <laughs> it's not. Uh, so Penny, about journalists again, and uh, because you worked also with journalists in your academic field, uh, what would you say on maybe more personal level, what is the main challenge for them? Well, <clears throat> I, I think that another big challenge that we see in the field um, which is affecting my students also, mm -hmm. as they consider, especially we have students from all over the world who are practicing journalists, um, is safety. And you think it's very easy to think, oh yeah, in other countries where there's war, it's unsafe to be a journalist. But even in a lot of stable, objectively safe countries, it's increasingly unsafe, uh, whether you're suffering online harassment or harassment within the newsroom, uh, you know, threats, for your profession, not only economically, but also personal threats that they're suffering uh, just in their social media sort of environments, in addition to the physical threats that many journalists face. Um, that's definitely a, a very serious one, um, which is also, well, on a less personal and more societal um, level connected to uh, another problem, which is framing and biases in the media. Um, as you said, like journalists from different countries um, interact in different kinds of reporting and um, we've seen that also in, for current events that the same, the very same thing can be very differently reported in the media and um, you address that in one of your papers called Us and Them and you write that journalists um, engage often unintentionally in ethnocentric news coverage, so news coverage that is somewhat lenient towards the own group. Um, can you explain a little bit how that happens? <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is something I'm quite interested in research-wise and also teaching-wise, but um, it's hard to pin a causal finger on why this might happen, but we see these very strong patterns. Um, if you have two countries in war, then the coverage will be very much swayed, typically the mainstream coverage, in favor of the home country, even in the face of very clearly problematic action. Um, but this also happens even covering foreign conflicts if you have specifically strategic trade relations or diplomatic relations. So U.S. coverage of the situation in Israel and Gaza right now is a classic example where we expect a lot of U.S. coverage to be pretty favorable because there's an incredibly strong relationship diplomatically and trade-wise between the U.S. and Israel. Now, that said, why do journalists cover it in this way? There's a lot of different reasons that that can happen. The biggest one, I would say, I'm not going to rank these causally in terms of strength. I don't have the regression model to support it, but I would say is uh, that you have, they have to rely on official sources for information, right? And official sources have an agenda, whereas journalists, we would hope, maybe have slightly less of an agenda. They also themselves um, work for businesses, just as Lizana is saying, who have commercial imperatives. So unless you're like a super well-funded public broadcaster, you have to please your readers to a certain extent and present news that they're most likely to tune into. And if your public opinion is going to be, to a certain extent, skewed in a certain way, it might be advantageous for your editors to say, okay, let's, let's soften this angle a little bit or be a little less critical towards these politicians, et cetera. And then the final element I would say that we cover in my research when we're talking, this is more about how journalists cover like military atrocities of the home country, like US soldiers torturing prisoners, for example. You have also the own social identity of the journalists themselves who might affect how they interpret these atrocities because none of us wants to think that our fellow in-group members are capable of committing these things, even if rationally we can know that that happens. We suspect that there's some even sort of, yeah, unknown tendency to soften these sort of horrible events when reporting about your own in-group versus uh, demonized out -group. Let's give that just um, to Lizanne, because one of the first things you, you mentioned very interestingly was um, biased sources that you rely on, for example, governmental ones. Um, as a journalist, you aim at reporting the truth, but that's very hard oftentimes. Mm, from your perspective and experience, how do you verify sources? How do you deal with, with that problem? Yeah, this is a, a very good question. And it, it's, it's a challenging one for every story that you will cover. Um, and also linking back to maybe the previous point uh, I made about you know, having to, to publish to actually sustain yourself. I remember um, during like, some of the stories I, I, I wrote or reported on, uh, my editor would say, no, you have enough sources now, like just you know, write the piece. 
Um, and I would be like, yeah, I mean, it's three sources, you know, I have literature and stuff and reports to back it up, but I'm actually not so sure that I have captured the wide range, the variety of, of, um, of takes on this issue, which, which really, um, you know, led me to sometimes, and I have all these files on all of these, the stories that I did so far, and I've, I think on average had eight conversations per piece, which is a lot. But it was something that I, at least in my work, I, I really tried to, um, and you know, without, I mean, I'm not without bias, that would be, that would be, you know, that's impossible. But it is at least, you know, trying to stay curious, trying to stay open enough to, to the outcomes of, of different, um, different, different sources. I, I remember also being very inspired, um, if I may present one example of that, actually not my work, but I was really inspired by it, of this, New York Times journalist um, in 2018 when we had this child separation policies at the Mexican-US border. And there was a lot of reporting on, on how, you know, this was Trump, oh, Trump's fault and he, it was his policy and this is why, you know, is, and all of that, I mean, part of that absolutely, you know, um, true probably, but this, there was this New York Times journalist who said, ah, I'm, I'm actually gonna go to the border and see for myself, you know, who are these people enforcing this? Who are the people? And she discovered that there was some administrative, super silly mistake on a form that actually made it really hard for children to find their parents back after the, after the, the decision on immigration or decision on the asylum procedure had been made. And what I found so good about that reporting was she didn't take this you know, a pretty polarized and, and um, uh, source-based information as, as her sole guidance. And she kept being open and curious. And then actually she found this and it, it, it had a huge impact. So it's, you know, it's also this kind of rigorous, curious uh, reporting that, that will mitigate this bias somewhat, hopefully. Yeah, and also shows the importance really or the impact it can have to actually be physically present at a story. Yes. Yeah, so we just talked about covering the news with different perspectives and sometimes even contradictory perspectives about the same event portrayed by, by news. And Penny, let me direct that to you. Will we see the end of the public discourse just because of that? I know that's maybe a bit extreme, but... Um, the end, okay. So if the, basically if the information environment gets so polarized that no one can speak to each other, we have this. Because there is kind know. of really different vocabulary yeah. that people use to describe the same event. Indeed. And, the, and you always have now the kind of Trump style, like, no, that's fake news. Yeah. Right. I have alternate facts. <clears throat> I think that there's a real risk that the world forgets how to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. But I think that that risk is magnified by the fact that we read all this information about that exact problem in the news and it's echoed to us in social media and we're constantly surrounded by it. So when you actually sit down with your neighbors in a smaller community, we both live in Amsterdam Oost, and I'm sure some of my neighbors are voted for very different parties than I might vote for, could I vote, <laughs> in national elections in the Netherlands. Um, but if you actually sit there and you have a common solution, it, go, it all goes back to group identity for me, right? If we have a common identity and we're trying to solu seek solutions to the same problem, it's very easy to connect back to the humanity with people that otherwise you might be different from. So my vision for the future, hoping for my children's sake, is that the massive sort of social media echo chamber of disaster will <clears throat> slow down. We will then slightly be less primed on a daily basis to think that there are these other people that think so differently than we do. And we will remember that there are instances in which we do share this humanity with our neighbors and not everything comes down to these political issues that are so polarized. So I don't think we have to lose it, but I think that the media, well no, not the media, but social media channels are playing a role in facil facilitating our drive towards that cliff edge. But you are more optimistic than pessimistic. Yeah, I definitely am optimistic because I think everybody, and especially the students I teach, you know, you start to get sick of the insanity, so you turn off your phone for a while. And I know that there are more and more young people trying to tune a little bit away from <clears throat> these doom scrolling habits. So I think that we, as humans, will <laughs> pull ourselves back from the ledge before we fall off it. 
So we just talked about those sources of reliable information and how journalists can do that. And case often, oftentimes academia is perceived to be one of those sources. But we think that there is a, a decisive difference here because in academia, the narrative has to flow from the data, but in journalism, the data is collected to align with a narrative. Um, first, let me ask you this. Do you think that's true? Um, I think that is, look, if, uh, idealistically, that is true. Um, sometimes, like, there is also bad science, and there are also scientists who already have a narrative in their mind when they start writing a paper and then they will find the data to fit that narrative and there's i mean there's plenty of examples of that so idealistically yes in practical terms like don't don't put me on the record for every <laughs> everyone else that's I, yeah uh, that that is not always it's not always true for sure so would you say that in these terms the journalists can even take the data from academia and and use them in their in their papers, in their articles. Is that even compatible? I think it's somewhat I think it can be compatible, but I think journalists and scientists tend to kind of um, think about the world in a different way mm -hmm. and and science academia often really embraces the uncertainty and um, and I think with journalism that is a little bit more about the real world. I, I, I was listening today uh, about a podcast with a climate scientist and she gave, I think, a very good um, kind of one-liner about this. She said, the goal of my model is not to build a, uh, not to have a model in which the real world happens, but one in which the real world could happen. So that is part of like a range of possibilities, and I think that is something that conflicts a little bit with journalism, which tends to focus on the thing that is supposed to happen rather than this big range. Or that is happening. Yeah. Or that's happening. Um, another one-liner that we actually got um, in a free talk from your from you was um, that um, um, sorry that. Um, Science is uh, relatively objective until politics gets into it. You found that very good. Um, That's on the record. Right? <laughs> that is on the record, exactly. I see it. <laughs> um, would you say, though, however, that in any case, when you want to um, like translate academia to the public, it is necessary uh, to bring politics into it through the journalism? Whether it's necessary to bring it in, I don't think so, at least. The, the way that I always, or what I always tell to my students, at least, is okay, look, let's talk about these, these models, and let's, you know, these models kind of describe the way that the real world works, and then when you want to take these models to the real world, when you want to actually say about like, what you should do in terms of policy, at that point, a, a kind of a moral question comes into play. Like, what do you think we should do as a country? And at that point, I as a scientist or as an economist, I think my role is to step back and like, let, you, like, let you take your decision, like what world do you want to live in? And I don't think necessarily politics has to come into play. If the goal is to simply describe the way the world works, then it doesn't have to be inherently political, maybe. Um, I, I was, I don't think, I think it depends on the topic, right? And where you need funding from and what you're trying to accomplish. But I agree, I agree with what you're saying. Um, all right, let's come back to another source of bias that you also mentioned at the very start, uh, which is not the sources, but the journalists themselves. So um, oftentimes, or always, when, when we write, um, or our writing is tinted by our own presumptions or um, political beliefs um, and this is unintentional but as a journalist Lizanne how do you how do you address that can you even yeah yeah I mean it's I think it's um, yeah so what I, I guess one one thing to do would be um, to have to have this representation of, of voices right and of, of views. I think it's it's always interesting where we you know this 
conversation about bias is, is, is really, it's, it's everywhere. Um, you know, it's, and, and, and I mean, rightfully so in a way. I, I just think that it's not the only, you know, journalist ethical value or ethics that, that you uphold, right? So you also, we have one source is no source. So you always need multiple sources. You fact check, you, um, you have hearsay. So there is, you know, there is this other, um, ethical standards that you do need to take into account as a journalist to do your work in a credible way. And I think we've actually seen this uh, move towards, back towards this kind of very classical reporting of what, where, when, why, with this whole OSINT movement, right, of open source uh, intelligence and um, you know, all sorts of investigations worldwide and you know, citizens contributing to that with their um, social or um, you know footage of their phones and and reconstructing events that happened um, and I'd, actually if you if you also ask me I don't know we're, we're probably going to go there like the, the future of journalism like I think that very much um, you know is about that classical role of going back there and uh, using you know new skills have gamers on your team have architects on your team to to. Um, to reconstruct events and to, um, I mean, I have, can I mention, you know, for instance, the, the, the Bellingcat investigation about, about MH17, the downing of MH17, it was them that said, oh, this book record was actually uh, from Russia. It came from Russia because we have the footage, we connected everything, and it came from across the border. Uh, yeah, you were starting with biases, I'm ending with something completely different, but yeah, it's just to say that, that this is something that, you know, that is, that is very much um, how you also mitigate and check yourself and keep checking your, your, uh, your facts. Yeah, I wanted to just jump in also to say that, um, you know, we have something that teaching journalism to students from global, the global world, let's say, <laughs> very ineloquently put, sorry, uh, has taught me is that, of course, we take for granted this idea of objectivity and non-biased journalism to the extent that's possible being the best thing. But there's a lot of context where journalism, especially in like post-war torn countries, its function is entirely different. It's trying to rebuild a, a national identity or bolster harmony within a certain society. And so therefore, that bias is fully acceptable, so to say, in a certain way. So I think we have a tendency, and I, it's one perfectly that's understandable, but it's easy for us to say, okay, we should be as objective as possible. But it's important to recognize that in certain contexts that may not be actually the goal. Yeah, very important point there. Um, yeah, you mentioned before also how important it is to um, bring in different perspectives in order for um, yeah, objectivity as far as it works um, to function. And um, we're going to do that now also by opening the floor um, to some audience questions, if there are any. Small question uh, concerning the emergence of this on new media, and it seems like everyone can be a journalist posting breaking news online and getting so many views without even fact checking these sources or or the frames that they are that they are within. And my question is: Is there uh, the difference between these self media and the traditional media is it necessary to have this difference now? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say a great question, yeah. and absolutely because I think that traditional or professional, professionally trained journalists now are the ones who can do exactly what Lisan is saying and take that open source material and figure out, okay, wait, this guy's just got an agenda. He wants me to show this video, which may or may not be reliable at all. They can aggregate all that information, evaluate its factuality, and then present it. So the role of the journalist has fundamentally changed under this model, where it's, or the news organization, let's say, where it's less about doing that original, you know, on the ground reporting potentially, 
but rather gathering information, evaluating its credibility, and then producing the best possible version of that, which actually makes the journalist's role much more like an academic's role, right? Gathering evidence, designing a reliable way that's credible and valid to study and understand that, and then tell the narrative about it. The narrative might have a different goal than it does for an academic, but I think these two professions are actually coming closer together. Um, so let, let us go back to the discussion about current challenges of media and we identify other challenges in social media because we know that in the last 20 years social media has radically changed the media landscape. So very briefly, from your perspective, um, is social media more of a blessing or a curse for your work? And let me start with case here. Ooh, that is a difficult one. Um, I think overall, Overall, probably a blessing if you want to be really, I mean, let, let's be idealistic and optimistic for once. Um, I'll do the bad cop. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We talked about this before. Right? I'll do the good cop, you do the bad cop. Um, no, it it's, is also a way, and that's, that's the nice part of it, it is also a way to reach your audience in a different way and to reach people who are really, who might be interested in this little niche that you just like being in and being able to talk to them. And that's from, that can, from an academic point of view, be really useful. Um, yeah, that there are some advantages there. Of course, the downsides are, are of course, also really, really there. The, like, it does tend to boil everything down too much and too quickly, which is always a danger with academia. Like I said, it's all, academia is all about uncertainty, I think, and that's, Social media usually doesn't leave space for nuance. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's time for the bad call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely also good to mention this, right? And it was really meant, of course, to democratize the, the space for public opinion. And I think, you know, in a way, um, I mean, that's a, that's, an, uh, that's a goal that, that you still, that's worth, worth pursuing still. Um, but I think for, um, uh, so not only is it you know, less nuanced and, and have we already talked about the you know, echo chambers and, uh, and uh, the algorithms and the, the business models that are behind, that are behind platforms. Um, I think in terms of, of journalism, for instance, the um, uh, traditional, where traditional media really struggle with um, getting, getting like, visitors to their to their um, so, so what, what platforms do is they just they will take the content, uh, put it in a post, and get the benefits from the clicks, the revenues from the clicks, right? I think you mentioned this as well, Penny. And, and then what we see is just a parallel news world where you know like the readers won't end up in um, uh, in the, the original at the original pieces that have actually the most content in them. And what I um, so to, to just mention one example, I think of a, of a newspaper that has tried to mitigate this or circumvent it is the New York Times who has around 100 different newsletters. So they're, they're, they've really built this new system of trying to get people to go right to their content. Um, I think the, the morning uh, briefing of the New York Times is, is around 16 million subscribers. Like it's the population of the Netherlands, basically. I think. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's crazy, and they've, they've really capitalized on this idea of we are the reliable people, like they're curating the content, people know who's writing this, and they also make a podcast, so there's all these different ways to, to keep people in their parallel world, but it's, it's really difficult, right, because most people do get their news consumption through social media and, and platforms, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, that's a big issue. And Penny, your perspective? Well, I'm like turning into this bitter old grandmother who's like, <laughs> stay away from social media, you know? And I myself quit almost all social media, except for LinkedIn, which does not count, I know. <laughs> so that shows you how cool I am. Um, anyway, I think I'm just so worried about the unintended other effects of this whole thing. So I was talking about at the beginning with kind of the misperception of all the vitriol and the fact that it can, social media slash the internet, 
facilitates all the wacky people coming together and being louder. And I think that sometimes that's dangerous and sometimes it's wonderful for wacky people to find other wacky people and they can whack out together, whatever. But I just think that it facilitates dangerous ideas being shared more readily. And then meanwhile, we know that there are severely detrimental effects on mental health for young people for using you know, these devices too much. So I tend to be much more pessimistic about that side of things, even though I'm optimistic generally in life. <laughs> more of a curse than a blessing. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the detrimental effects maybe um, uh, is something that maybe everyone experiences, so that on social media, like you have a 15 second video of cute dogs playing, and then you swipe on and there is like um, some update from a news channel, and then you swipe on and there is like a video in which some kind of Hans from rural Germany demands all immigrants to be thrown out of the country. Um, so you really have this mixture and fusion of like entertainment and, um, and information and also propaganda even sometimes. Um, so what would you say, Penny, does that mean? for the people consuming? I think it means that the media literacy that has always been important is like a thousand times more important than every education for every young person should start there. So already my, I have two kids in Dutch school and I mean two kids period and they're both in Dutch school. <laughs> it sounded like I have two in Dutch school, two in French school, and two, <laughs> whatever. Two kids, they're in Dutch school. And my kids are the only ones who are like, well, YouTube's not allowed at our house. And I'm like, yes, because your mother works in media and politics. <laughs> like, all the other kids just watch sort of unfiltered, unparental monitored YouTube, which maybe works for their family, but it does not work for my family because immediately, not only the mix of entertainment and stuff, but you know, the documented kind of radicalization of these videos, the algorithm that drives you towards more and more extreme content. And I'm not you know, a conspiracy theorist are overly scared even though I'm playing the angry grandma role. <laughs> but there are real dangers there. And I think that without learning to um, be ready for that content and learning to understand that what you see is different than what every other person might see in terms of the algorithm. And that's becoming increasingly channelized into your own mediated and curated environment. I think that that can pose dangers for people's perceptions of reality. Um, who is to teach the media literacy, in your opinion? I think it should start already in elementary school. Um, and then I think that, you know, it should continue throughout, uh, just as now we can focus at university on our, our literacy about finding good information sources and critiquing studies and understanding theories and what makes good theory. The media literacy should start already at elementary school. And then like all the people who miss that should have buffer courses for parents <laughs> or something, I guess, to catch everybody up. And not only there is this fusion that we just talked about, but also what Lizanne and Penny also mentioned is that there is this, there are those echo chambers and people get news that they are tailored to their beliefs. So what do you think are the consequences of that, Lizanne? Consequences of the echo chambers? Yes. Um, very... Um, Tunnelly vision, uh, limited information about about many things, and it, yeah, I don't know it, how how to answer this without going very cliche into. Um, there's probably, I mean, um, really the consequence of of not anymore being open to the other person. I mean, what you just mentioned, Penny, it was really important. I think about um, the the relative like also losing sight of that you actually do have a lot in common. Like I, I do think we actually we have to work really hard for this. Like it's not an, you know, it's not a coincidence that during the elections times there is a ton of initiatives that will link you to a political opponent that make you just have a conversation, you know, and, and just uh, sit in a room together, talk about, talk about some things and let's talk about political, um, topics that you disagree on or, or about any topics, about family or like connect, you know, and it's, um, um, so the consequences of not doing that is that you, you do end up in your own, um, in your own political space only. And, and do you think that facilitates also the extreme ideas? For sure, forward? yeah, for sure, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, so don't yeah. pin me down, but I mean, um, so I think Penny would be the better person to ask yeah. how, how this leads to maybe 
extremist um, views or, um, or, or movements. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important not to oversimplify. I, I, yeah. Oversimplify. Yeah. I think I am implying that there's this direct effect. And one of the most fascinating things for me about communication research is that we know that there are no, like, they used to think right after World War II when the field kind of started that it was like a hypodermic needle. Like, you put the media show in and then I immediately start hitting my neighbor if it's a violent show, right? And it's taken us decades to figure out, no, 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 it's much more nuanced than that. It's not just a direct effect. However, all the stuff we're talking about, and I, I would press you to think, okay, if you sit all day on Twitter slash X, doom scrolling, don't you feel way worse than you did the day that you didn't do that, right? So there are these very powerful media effects that we witness in daily life, but they're difficult to demonstrate empirically without understanding that there's nuance. All that is to say, it's not, you know, I'm not making out, YouTube can be marvelous, and there are things I do let my kids watch with me. <laughs> um, it's not that if you watch YouTube, you will become radicalized and join a cult. That's not. Room for discussion is on YouTube. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> That's not the kind of causal claims that anyone would want to make. I think maybe politicians would want to make that, but they're nonsensical. But I think it's more about this idea that without, you know, you just have to have moderation and everything in life. And if you're only listening to one source of information, or you're in an algorithm that is full of misinformation or disinformation, then you can end up with a pretty skewed vision of reality until you talk to your neighbor about something else that's unrelated, and then you can kind of break back out of that cycle. Um, so we just heard that the effects of, of social media are manifold. Um, Case, do you see also effects really um, that your students, like with your students directly, for example, attention span, etc.? Um, I think that the attention span, like that for sure also matters. To be fair, then, I, then if you think back to yourself as a student where was I such a great student? Was I always paying attention? Maybe not so much. But I think in terms of <clears throat> attention span, certainly things have changed. And, or at least that's the impression that I get. You, like, as a teacher, you try to put on more of a show to kind of keep, you really try to keep people engaged. And even then, uh, you are sometimes not successful. Um, I think the biggest difference of actually, that, like from when I was a student to now, is that when I was a student, what I remember is when the teacher announced that there was a break, people would start talking. And now when you announce that there is a break, people stop talking. <laughs> and they just sit on their phone for, for 15 minutes. Yeah. But you also stressed this optimistic view in the beginning in our question. Do you think that's the kind of price that we, that we pay for getting the research out there to the for the public. I don't think that this, I think the, the, the very niche benefit that mm. for, for academia, you, if you ask me about that, I think, okay, maybe there might be something positive, but whether or not uh, it's a positive net for society for everything, I might sit in the, in the bitter grandparent uh, corner <laughs> a little bit more. Um, because, yeah, I think, I do think things have changed. And from a teaching perspective also, people learn, I think, differently now than, than when I was a student or, or even five to ten years ago. You see a number of students I've also been very impressed with who try to go back to a more thoughtful way of learning for themselves who really think about this, which I think is very impressive. But I do think the attention span part also changes the way students learn. I mean, listening to a web lecture on three times the speed I, 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 could, I couldn't do that uh, as a student. I this, couldn't, yeah. Yeah. this was actually an was interesting observation, maybe to add on to this from a case observations. I think it's been the first time some lecturers reported that they got in, uh, feedback in the re evaluation saying, I speak too slow, you speak too slow, and they said, I never had that feedback before um, in the 20 years that I'm teaching or whatever. So. Um, and then playing it at a triple speed, that this is apparently possible, um, that, you know, that the feedback from people in the room was, you're so slow. Um, yeah, it's also, I don't know, I don't know if that proves or says anything really other than illustrate that this might be a, a, 
at least uh, at least quicker a quicker kind of bored being bored or yeah, losing losing it and what it can be really problematic for is like sinking in this new knowledge when you really have to understand something this does not come easily yeah. um, like you can really explain something like very superficially very in a very cool way in five minutes maybe and at school but then you don't have the in-depth understanding and for that you need to explain these things in a deep way and the student also needs some time to have that sink in and you also as a person who learns need to take the time to let things sink in and when attention span goes down that becomes a real problem and i think there we would see much more the the, the negative side of, of social media uh, than the, yeah for sure Mm. So you just mentioned um, that through social media, definitely the quality of academia is threatened at least, um, this, this deep thinking. Um, and to bring it back also to, to journalism, um, would you say that there is qualities of journalism that, that get lost when, when journalism is only presented on social media? Or do you think that there is maybe also some parts that can be replaced by social media? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous question. Um, so the way journalists write is different from academic writing, right? The way journalists write is they start with luring you into the story, putting the nut wrap, is what we call it, the, the biggest uh, um, chunk of information that you really want to get across, so then the, the gist of the story, which in academic papers comes at the end, or at least you build towards it, right? Yeah? No? <laughs> you start with it in the abstract and then you build towards it. Yeah, okay. Um, but anyway, so you, so you really start with that and then you, you enter some background and then there is the insights unpacked. And why is that? It is because people lose their attention often and, you know, or editors would cut from the from the bottom up. Um, and uh, so if, you know, I, I think what, what you lose is that you might risk uh, having only the headline, having only the, the tagline, the, the, right, as a, as a clickbait or as a, as a shortened <coughs> version, whereas actually the insights are unpacked at the end of the article and that's, that's the part where you really go into, into the nitty gritty of how is this reported and what are the nuances, right? What is the, the context that, that this was reported in where um, many people who will never reach this part of the article um, or it's being cut by editors because they think, yeah, you know, people will, will lose their interest here. And that's another, that's another problem. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily against short pieces. Like I think even this whole quote I've been using with my students, I'm seeing some of them here. You know, I'm, I'm, I wrote a long letter because I didn't have time for a short one. We, yeah, it's, it's way harder to write short, short things and to be very uh, eloquent. When I teach journalist trainings, I always say every word you can get, you know, get rid of, get rid of it. You don't need it. And it's different also in, in, in types, of, types of writing that you use. So I'm not necessarily against short pieces. I'm, I'm against losing the, the gist of, the, of the, the context and the nuance and the, the details yeah, that, that you actually also need. So we covered here, at least to some extent, the topic of journalistic and academic writing. We touched briefly upon that. But there are many people also in our audience that wants to get insights uh, about how to write persuasive articles. In case, what would you say that academia can learn from journalism to make a paper interesting enough so people actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and this is, I think this is a very good question. Um, I think for large parts, I think sometimes we write way too much for an audience that is fellow academics and that therefore makes it difficult to, it definitely makes it difficult for people who are not really deep into the material to read it. Though that's also kind of connected to the, you have to cut stuff out and what gets cut out is all of this pre-knowledge that's, I don't know, a, a first year student would like, uh, but that somebody deep within academia wouldn't mind uh, or doesn't need anymore. 
But what I think is really, to get back to the question, what I think is the way to do it is to be, um, is to try to give your readers also handholds on and, and try to give them real examples rather than just uh, citing numbers or, or losing yourself in technicalities. And I think this is something that you see already in quite a number of, of papers where <coughs> you can have in the, the empirical setup is usually like some assumptions are incredibly difficult to actually prove or impossible to actually prove. So what you wind up doing is you wind up writing two pages about the entire historical background behind your data set and why within that data set, because of that story, the assumption should hold. And I think that is, that is something where you can kind of learn a little bit from, from drawing like re on real world narratives, but also with, with results, like instead of, you know, instead of talking about how when investments go up by 1%, GDP growth goes up by 1.23%, um, talking about uh, real world examples, like, oh, if, you, if I use my, one, one example I like to use is, oh, if you, <coughs> instead of talking about these coefficients in numbers, give examples of two countries. Like, oh, if you go in terms of investment rate from, um, I don't know, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo to Belgium, then this is, the, uh, this is what effect that might have. Mm -hmm. And that gives readers more of a handhold because yeah. these numbers actually mean something mm -hmm. or these countries actually tell you something. Whereas these fake numbers rarely mean something. It's difficult mm -hmm. to get a good grip on that. Um, however, from a maybe more practical student perspective, um, you have to say that the mm, customs of academic writing are kind of strict and it is not um, very much appreciated by most um, tutors and lecturers if you don't um, obey very strongly to APA standards, for example. <laughs> um, how would you say, is it even possible like for a student to learn to write in a more innovative, maybe persuasive, different way. Um, you, Penny, I think so. Present? I'm a big believer in, I have a student here now who is in my methods class and I'm just making the argument that all academic research is also similar to journalism, you're telling a narrative and you're using evidence that you collect in order to make that narrative persuasive. So even if you have to, you know, cite your sources in APA style and you have to use a boring table with a specific formatting, the way that you tell that story is up to you ultimately. And I think that one of the biggest skills we can use, and that I'm also trying to teach students when we talk about presenting, is translating the jargon from academic terminology into everyday language. So just as you're saying, give these concrete examples that are relatable, you can also think about how you describe you know, how you describe specific concepts or theories in your article. It's very hard if you're targeting that article at an academic journal, it has to be, you know, translated a specific way. But if you're making it your thesis and you don't necessarily want to publish, but you're thinking, okay, I want to turn this into something else or share it with my family or whatever it is, write it in a way that they would appreciate reading it and that the terminology is, you know, done in such a way that it's relatable to them and understandable. So this idea of translating, I think, is is relevant, I don't think it's impossible. I think that the academic format, so not necessarily APA per se, but yeah, the audience that you're aiming for should dictate largely what you're going for. But there's also like, once you understand the academic format, you also can start to understand when you might deviate from that. I have supervised plenty of theses that deviated from the standard academic format, but they all did for a reason and first, once you have that reason, then it's fine to deviate. Also, for a lot of journals, you can you can freely deviate if you have a good reason for it. But like just deviating because you want to, well, there's a reason this format is so common in the first place, right? Yeah, there's yeah, I agree, and I I would also very much agree with with Penny on the, the language and the jargon. Like I, sometimes I I think it's. Um, confused by students when reading things like to be as formal as possible and to be as to use as vague terms as possible um, because this sounds interesting and, and I've sometimes presented 
work back to students at, at like just anonymously, like not scapegoating anyone, <laughs> but saying, hey, but what, what, what does this paragraph actually say? Like, can you tell me? Because I don't know. And there is, uh, and then students are like, yeah, I think, you know, this, this is maybe referring back to this theory, but you know, in, it, again, writing a short letter is harder than a long one. Being concrete and specific, even though you, you remain within certain formats, is more difficult than being fake and saying, um, uh, talking about contributions and like seeing how the consequences may materialize in a in a net and blah, you know, <laughs> where you you just lost, you know, you lose your reader, whether it's you know an academic uh, supervisor or or it's a it's an audience that needs to have uh, or that wants to be engaged in the topic and you know for. Just, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's very good to be aware of these mm. things. You can be very clear as an academic writer. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we could talk about this for yeah. hours, uh, <laughs> but we've talked for a while and more than eight seconds probably have passed as well. Uh, so most people's attention is probably now exhausted. So we will then therefore very consciously move to less extensive, more sensational questioning called the short answer questions. So please answer following questions as briefly as possible, aim at one sentence. One sentence, oh, one sentence. We took out the ideally only one word. <laughs> um, all right, Penny, will media, specifically social media, bring people together or tear them apart? Both. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Nailed it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, case, will anyone except for professors still read academic papers in five years? Yes. <laughs> um, Lisa, will social media be the end of journalism? No. <laughs> you got the assignment, that's great. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, just to come back to the who, the students we, the professors assign the papers to. And we'll read them. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, okay, um, Penny. What is one thing you see that you see changing in journalism and academia in the upcoming years? <laughs> you can also say two for each respectively. Um, I think with journalism, it's much more this move towards data and whether that's open source data or data analysis of empirical data, sort of a very data focused version of the world. Um, in academia, depending on what field you're in, it's possible we'd actually want to move a little bit away from data and back into a little more theorizing, ironically, because I think we've gotten so caught up in fancy data analysis. This is a very long sentence. It's a run-on sentence, but it's still one sentence. Um, we've gotten so caught up in data that we forget to try to make theories out of it, and there's so much new data that we need to theorize. Okay, Case, um, based on what Penny just said, um, what is your number one advice for people going into academia and wanting to write better papers? Always, okay, no, I, I, I'm going to quote um, uh, my, uh, father of microeconomics, Alfred Marshall, who said, um, if you build a model, you solve all the math, uh, and you can then find that you cannot put the, the math into words, Burn the math. <laughs> that, I think, would be good advice. That's a great advice, yeah. And Lizanne, what is the number one advice that you would give people that want to start their career in journalism? Oh my god. Um, <laughs> the number one advice work hard to stay curious. Or join room for discussion, or else try to Or join, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, so with those short answer questions, we want to wrap up our panel today. Thank you so much, Case, Lizanne, and Penny, for joining us. It has been a real, in, really insightful one hour, um, and we've learned a lot about the current and future challenges of journalism and the media. And um, what we're going to make out of it, I think we got a lot of inspiration. It's in our hands. <laughs> or rather in our pen. <laughs>
And from us, there are two announcements. First announcement for those of you who can't get enough of room for discussion. We have very, very good news. In two days from 12 to 1, we will host Georgios Papakonstant, you know, Foreign Minister of Finance during the Greece cri Euro crisis. Uh, so be there. And second, do not leave us yet, as after we'll have the 10 minute break, the Bostra Economica will pursue with their award ceremony for the best article. But before that happens, let's thank our guests with a big round of applause.